What was the appeal of Marxism-Leninism to your generation? I think the appeal of Marxism-Leninism for my generation was extremely great and large, a very deep impact. Uh, to maybe say a word, I was from 1935 to 1945 in the Soviet Union under Stalin. I was 14 when I came there and 24 when I left. So I went to Soviet schools and later to Soviet universities, to the Institute of Foreign Languages, and especially important was the Comintern School, the highest ideological training school for foreign communists in the Soviet Union. And the whole life... 2366, take... Something like that. Two. What was the appeal of Marxism-Leninism to your generation? The appeal of Marxism-Leninism for our generation was, I think, extremely profound. Um, I was from 1935 to 1945 in the Soviet Union, and uh, meaning under the period of Stalin, and we were taught Marxism-Leninism on different levels in school, in the Institute of Foreign Languages, later in the Comintern School, the highest elite school for foreign communists, uh, always on a higher level. And uh, if I look back at this tremendous amount of teaching we had, uh, the first I think is we were convinced at that time that this is the only scientific world outlook. All these other groups, social democrats, liberals, conservatives, they have opinions, but we, Marxism, Leninism, is a scientific world outlook. It's like mathematics and physics. We know what is happening, and it's consisting of philosophy, dialectic materialism, uh, the whole approach to history, whole hist history theory called historical materialism, political economy, the whole our views on economy, and uh, then, of course, the political consequences, the political theories. And everything is scientific here. It's uh, nature, society. History is governed by laws, and these the laws only Marxist Leninist know these laws. Other people, these bourgeois people, may be better in this or that practical question, but we are superior because we know the laws, and therefore you had the feeling of superiority, and also a feeling of security if there are historical laws, and according to these historical laws and economic laws, uh, the history will derive to a socialist and later communist society, history is on our side. But there might be some setbacks and some failures and some mistakes, but the victory is given. Now, this given victory does not mean that you should sit around idle. No, you know the laws, and then through your own activity, the activity of Marxist Leninists, you can hasten the historical process. 2367, take one. Uh, the second main appeal of Marxism Leninism for us at that time was the aim, the ultimate aim, the future classless communist society. The whole history from primitive com communism slave-owned society, feudalism, capitalism, and then the big turning point in history leading towards socialism and communism, a communist classless system, no government, no repression, no army, no police, no prisons, no laws, withering away of the state, complete freedom of everybody, person, personal freedom, uh, workers' collectives, running factories. Um, the ultimate aim was, I think, Tremendous. And therefore, the 7th of November 1917, the October Revolution, was not a Russian event. It was the turning point of history. Regardless of all the mistakes later, it went towards the ultimate aim of a classless communist society. And this made a tremendous impact on us, who at that time believed in Marxism and Leninism. Um, could I ask you before I ask the next question, could you keep looking at me? It probably is better for the viewer. Um, how did this ideology, which you learned in the USSR, now, how did this actually influence your actions when you went back, you and other Communist Party leaders went back to Central Europe after the war? It had a tremendous impact during all the time I was a believing Marxist-Leninist. Uh, the impact was that, uh, first of all, when you read bourgeois 
papers, Western papers, bourgeois books, they seemed so unclear, so diffuse. Um, they had no, no reality in it. And uh, secondly, Marxism-Leninism uh, was so strong, the impact, that you didn't look at reality anymore. You saw in the Soviet Union mass repressions, uh, millions of arrests of innocent people, privileges of party officials, personality cults, Russification, everything which was in contradiction to ideology, but you tried to explain it, to defend it, because after all, these things were small things, practical things. The real thing was the great long-term implementation of the ideological aims of Marxism-Leninism. What were the practical consequences of this, though, as you, when, when you became political leaders of these new states? Uh, when uh, we uh, went returned from Moscow to Germany at the end of World War II on the 30th of April 1945, uh, we uh, had a very clear picture of what we wanted to do. We believed in Marxism-Leninism, and the ultimate aim was, of course, to create a socialist and later communist Germany, but we are taught over and over again the different stages. So when we returned to Berlin, we didn't want to introduce socialism. Uh, on the contrary, we were informed to struggle against anybody, the sectarian communists who speak about socialism. We wanted an anti-fascist democracy and um, a unifying movement of communists, social democrats, Christians, uh, liberals, a broad anti-fascist democratic unity as a necessary transition, a long-term transition. And I must openly state that I believed in it. And I believe that now there will be a new page in the history of Germany, an anti-fascist democracy. And this anti-fascist democracy would last a long, long time. And later, when the society is ripe, we then would may begin the transformation towards socialism. But that is only what we know. We wouldn't tell it to anybody else. But this didn't last long. Actually, what you put into practice was in a in effect, a sort of communist dictatorship, was it not? Uh, I would uh, deny that at the beginning, I think there were many communists like myself who really believed of only having a few key positions and really working comradely together with all anti-fascists of other persuasion. But, of course, very soon, these kind of believing, illusionary communists like myself saw the reality and saw that the real die-hard Stalinists have something very different in mind than what the idealistic communists at that time believed in. It became very clear quickly that when the, the Communist Party they took over, were interested in total control of groups and individuals and so on. How did you? How was this experienced by people in ordinary life? This ambition to have total control by the party. Can I have a so, moment? That's so. very difficult. Uh, one minute. 2368, take one. When the Communist Party in Central Europe entered a more Stalinist phase and they aimed at sort of total control of groups and individuals and so on, how did this actually take place in practice? What did it feel like? What did it mean? There was a tremendous difference between the first period from 1945 to 1948 and then since 1948. In the first period, at least in East Germany, but I think in some other countries of Eastern Europe as well, there was a real wish to collaborate with other anti-fascist forces. Maybe also in order that they should share the burden of the very difficult situation in the first years after World War II. But we believed still in comradely working together. At the end of 47, beginning of 1948, especially after the February 48 coup in Czechoslovakia, it became obvious that now the communists were running towards getting total control. And the more idealistic communists uh, were very sad and even threatened by it, and fearful and resentful and oppositional. And that is where my big opposition came. But the Stalinists were happy, joyful, now it's our time. Now we can get away with all these others. So there was a differentiation inside the communists 
And of course, many idealistic communists were either purged, some, many arrested, and some, like myself, escaped. Why, it seems a paradox, almost a mystery, why did the party, having achieved so much control, for example, of the political apparatus, why was it so determined to obtain such total control everywhere, trying to wipe out religion, uh, the old bourgeois classes and so on? Why, why was this ambition for total control so? The desire of the communists in Eastern Europe since 1948 not to limit themselves with strong influence, but to desire the total control of all aspects of society was a product of Stalinism. Stalinism implies total control. Not, it's not enough to determine policy, to influence policy, to work together with other groups. No, total control of economy, politics, armed forces, foreign policy, uh, social, social problems, uh, ideology, culture. Total control, nothing less. This was Stalinism, now imported from the Soviet Union into the countries of Eastern Europe. Was this a, was, did Marxism, Leninism play a role in this, or was it simply the peculiar characteristic of Stalin in his reign that, that influenced the communist uh, It was well? the peculiar characteristics of Stalinism, justified with Marxism, Leninism, with a somewhat falsified Marxism, Leninism. I now turn to the Tito-Stalin dispute. I wonder if you could tell us what, what that dispute really was about and what its implications were for the, for the Communist parties elsewhere in Central Europe. Uh, the Tito-Stalin break uh, in uh, many Western books is described as a struggle between Yugoslav nationalism and Moscow international communism. There's hardly any statement with which I disagree as much as with this primitive and wrong statement. The reality was it was a struggle between Moscow's hegemonial control and the desire of honest communists in East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, and Yugoslavia to go their own way, not because they were nationalists, but because they wanted to go their own way in order to look for a new model for creating a socialist system which, what we thought at that time, would embody both the correct tenets of Marxism-Leninism and avoid the horrors we all knew existed in Stalinist Soviet Union, the search for a new model. And that was the essence of the Soviet Yugoslav break in 1948. And that is why so many non-Yugoslavs, like me in East Berlin, were so favorable towards this big desire of the Yugoslavs to break the Moscow chain and to go an own way and create maybe a model of a social society without personality cult, without collectivization, without mass repressions, without purges, without the predominance of the secret police, to create a kind of better socialism. And that was the hope many people had in East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, and that's why we were secretly Titoists at that time. What were the consequences of Stalin's vigorous rejection of this idea of developing alternative models of socialism? What happened in the communist parties in Central Europe after the Yugoslav split? The uh, Yugoslav break had an international consequences. It was not only the expulsion of Yugoslavia from the world communist movement, but a ruthless suppression of any communists in any East European country who was either in favor of Yugoslavia or in favor of a different model Sorry. or even... Sorry. What impact did the Tito-Stalin split have on the communist movement in Central Europe? Uh, the impact was not only that Yugoslavia was expelled from the world communist movement and was now an independent a communist world country, but there were mass repressions, mass purges in East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria against all communist party members and officials who were sympathetic to Yugoslavia, who were dreaming of a different road to socialism and a different mo model of socialism, and even those people were purged who were suspected of might wishing such a di direction. And the uh, mass repression 
of what was called Titoist at that time uh, meant that all the communist parties now were much more disciplined and much more Stalinists than before these purges between 1948 and 1950. Was the real attack on people called Titoists Stalin's determination there should be no real autonomy, no real independence in these Central European states, even though they had communist regimes? Well, this, the main reason for these purges was the totalitarian nature of Stalinism. There should be no country going another way to socialism. There should be no party members, party officials who were dreaming of such a way. The total control um, and the fear that Tito and Yugoslavia might create a model more and more clear and therefore might be a serious danger for the totality of the Stalinist rule over Eastern Europe. Turning to East Germany now, how would you characterize the uprising of June 1953 and why has there never been another outbreak like that in the GDR since then? The uprising in June 1953 was primarily a workers' uprising of a mass character supported by the majority of the population of East Germany. And uh, it was less like the later Prague Spring and a little bit more like the Solidarność movement in Poland of 1980 and 1981, although, of course, on a much smaller scale. It lasted only a few days. And um, the reason why we had other uprisings in Eastern Europe, but not, an, uh, not again in East Germany, at least not up to now, is from my viewpoint primarily due to the fact that there was no country of the Soviet bloc where so many, where there were so many refugees as from East Germany. So all the active possible oppositionals escaped to East Germany. And secondly, uh, due in the last 10 years, the Honecker leadership made a rather clever mood. They not only permit, but even encourage the population to look to Western television broadcasts. And this is a loophole. They are two hours a day free of their own system. They can look and watch and pretend to be in another system. And then they take the permanent harshness of their own system easier. And I think this is the reason why later uprisings took place in other countries. But uh, I would not exclude the possibility that there will be, again, uprising in East Germany if the present or future leadership will not initiate reforms in due time. Do you think uh, East Germany has the most successfully controlled society? Yes, I would think from all, uh, I can't say yes, um, from all the uh, countries of the Soviet bloc, I would think that the East German regime is relatively, from a dictatorial viewpoint, which is not mine, the most successful in controlling the population. Why is that? The reason why, I think, is due to the fact that it is easier to control the German population than populations of other countries, because the population of East Germany has only known partially, a little freedom, 1945-46, but was already t had already the 12 years of Nazi, the Nazi regime, and therefore it was easier to recreate dictatorial structures. And I think it was also easier because all the oppositional people escaped to West Germany, and uh, therefore it was easier to control. But I would not overestimate the mechanism of control. I see also in East Germany tremendous contradictions and an increasing desire, particularly of the young generation, of more freedom, more independence, more autonomy, more initiative. What you say, would you say now is the central ideological claim made, made by the SED to justify its continued monopoly of power? The main ideological uh, reason given for the control is the idea that 
German Democratic Republic, how it is officially called, is the first workers and peasants government in the whole of German history. That it's a break of all the tragic German history before. That despite its difficulties and shortcomings, it is a model of a new society. But uh, I would be tend to incline that very few people believe it. What is the significance of the GDR regime's exploitation now of Prussia, Prussian traditions, even Prussian military traditions, and a sort of militarization of certain aspects of, of, of East German life? The new method of the Erich Honecker leadership in the last three or four years to use national tradition for its own legitimacy is, from my viewpoint, very important indeed. The East German regime has no legal claim to rule. It is a lawless rule. It has no democratic claim because there are no free elections. For Erich Honecker and his regime, and maybe the regime of his followers, there's only one way to try to legitimize, and that is to present itself as having a tremendous long historical tradition, which is made easier because the Western part, the Democratic Federal Republic, is a kind of very um, uh, sketchy on that. So they first started with Luther rather different from what Marx and Engels wrote about Luther, and then went even so far as claiming uh, as positively Frederick the Great. And uh, when, uh, in 1945, I had to write for party education one booklet after the other against Frederick the Second. If you use the term Frederick the Great, you were reprimanded by the party and could be expelled by the party. And now, Frederick the Great, it is the hope through national tradition to legitimize the rule of the present dictatorship. How far has the totalitarianism that marked the Stalinist era, how far has that really disappeared from the communist systems of Central Europe today? The totalitarian system in its essence still remains in certain fields. Namely, the idea that the dictatorship is not only to control the people, but to mobilize them, to mobilize them for the fulfillment of the aims of the dictatorship. What has changed tremendously are the methods of implementation. Under Stalin, mass arrests, regular purges, harsh party language were essence of the Stalinism. Now you don't need this anymore. You give them a little bit more leeway. You use a little bit more conciliatory party language. You don't arrest as many people anymore. You don't have mass purges anymore. You have a, a constant small reminders. We are there. Don't go too far. And these small reminders are enough, up till now at least, to keep these dictatorial systems in power. Is there enough of the Stalinist legacy built into these systems to mean that one couldn't rule out a return to a sort of neo-Stalinism as one option? Uh, I would not uh, rule out a return to neo-Stalinism. In fact, in my book on the future of the Soviet Union, I give it as one of the six possibilities. I don't think it is very likely but one cannot rule it out completely. The nomenclatura of the East European political power elite of the East European countries, they might return, or some might even wish to return to such a form when they feel endangered. And there's a big struggle now inside the political power elite between those who want to overcome the tremendous difficulties and contradictions by gradual reforms and those who want to overcome that, or at least pretend overcoming it, by increasing ruthlessness. I think that at present the reform wing has greater chances, but I would never rule out the danger of a return to neo-Stalinism. 2370, take one. To what extent can communist systems build into them genuine political and cultural pluralism 
without challenging the leading role of the Communist Party and without threatening the role of the Soviet Union. In the Communist Party system, there are sometimes discussions about what is called democratization. And I think we should know that, of course, this term does not mean democracy in the Western sense of the word. Pluralism, market economy, rule of law, multi-party system, no. But a democratization has a certain meaning. It means the party still rules, but it only rules the main directions and permits groups to have a little bit more, a little bit more autonomy and initiative. It is the attempt of remaining in power, but using less coercion for detailed questions, limiting it to the fundamental ones, and permitting certain groups inside the party to solve their own problems, hoping that thereby people will be more active, will have a certain degree of participation, and will show more initiative. The power remains, the method changes. How stable is this? Because how can you give people certain amount of freedoms and then tell them that they can't go any further? The problem with this new idea of democratization, which you might say limited autonomy, is of course very difficult. On one hand, it's a necessity. In a modern industrial society, you need autonomy, independence and initiative in order to continue a kind of economic progress. On the other hand, it is extremely difficult because if you give people a certain amount of freedom initiative, um, then very often they demand more. Uh, the question will remain if it will be possible for what communist reformers are thinking to, uh, to liberalize the system without giving up power, if this is possible at all. There are people in the West who think it's impossible, and there are people in the communist world countries who also claim it's impossible. The answer is not yet given. I would think there is a certain amount of possibility of liberalizing the system without that the whole system crushes. But uh, this is more an opinion because the example has yet not been given. Hungary and China are two examples where through reforms really a certain amount of things have changed, but we still don't know if this will be a stable form for the future. Would an alternative stable form be a return to economic efficiency to allow certain market systems to operate, but maintain them with even stronger discipline? There are people both in the Soviet Union and in the Eastern European countries among the political elite who try to avoid this democratization even in the limited form I mentioned before and try to modernize the system with more technocratic methods plus increasing discipline. There are strong forces in the political elites of all East European countries who favor that direction, but uh, this way I think is impossible. Technocratic disciplinization is no answer for the tremendous economic, social and political problems uh, the East European countries are confronted with. How would you assess the total damage done to society in Eastern Europe by communism in the last 40 years? Communist systems now rule 40 years over the countries of Eastern Europe or Central Europe included, uh, East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. And uh, the consequences are, first of all, in the economic, social sphere. In 40 years of communist rule, it has been absolutely clearly proven that in the economic technological advancement, they are far behind not only Western Europe, Japan and the United States, but even among some of the new developing countries like Taiwan, uh, South Korea, Singapore, so far behind, which uh, would not have been necessary. The forces are there. The second is in the social sphere. Uh, there's no question that the population of the mentioned countries of Central and Eastern Europe 
under communist control had tremendous sufferings which were unnecessary in that amount if another system more modern and more pluralistic would have existed. And uh, the third aspect is the cultural and intellectual sphere uh, where there was 40 years of suppression. There were certain periods here and then where the suppression was not harsh and there was a certain amount of cultural and intellectual freedom, but as a whole uh, the culture and intellectual development, of course, has suffered a great deal. Although, in this third aspect, I would say that much more has been done, not published, not seen, than many people in the West assume. And I would tend to think that if we would have free developments in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, now in the Soviet bloc, we would be astonished what creative energy has uh, has been there in these 40 years, which has been not published, not seen, but will be seen the moment democratic freedoms uh, will be appearing. So in all of these three uh, aspects, I would say there were tremendous sufferings. But I would like to say one positive aspect of 40 years rule of communism in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, and that is the politicization. People live in a political country. And if those who believe, there are very few left, those who are critical, those who are against, think much more in political terms than those people who live in Britain or Western Europe or United States who take democracy for granted. Whenever one speaks with refugees from East and Central Europe coming to the West, one is almost astonished how much more politically they are thinking. So 40 years, tremendous suffering, economy, social and cultural intellectual life. But the communist regimes politicized them. And this can be of great advantage for future reforms. 2371, take one. To sum up 40 years of rule of communist powers in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, led in the economic sphere to technological running behind, in the social field to tremendous hardships, 40 years of hardships for the population, in the cultural and ideological field, suppression. Um, but maybe there was one positive thing, and that was the politicization. People living in these countries are full of politics. They don't believe it. But they think critically. Some are even openly against it, but they think more in political terms. And one is always pleasant, astonished, when one speaks with refugees who think much more in political terms of political analysis than people who grow up in a Western democratic society and um, don't, are not under this pressure. And I think the politicization is uh, maybe the one positive point in 40 years of communist rules and might lead to those forces who in future will struggle for reforms of the inside the communist world countries. If Gorbachev's full reform program succeeds in, in the Soviet Union, will this allow real pluralism, real democratization in Eastern Europe or not? Since uh, Gorbachev became General Secretary on the 11th of March 1985, there is a tremendous change in the nature and the atmosphere and the political cultural atmosphere of the Soviet Union, what is called glasnost, but very little in actual changing the system, meaning perestroika. I uh, think that uh, Gorbachev and his followers, but they are a minority, maybe 15% of the officials are really in favor, mean it seriously. The obstacles are so great that the problem, if ever, this restructuring, this perestroika will take place, is a very difficult question to answer. Already today, however, the impact on the countries of Central and Eastern Europe is felt. Um, in Hungary under Janos Kadar, uh, Bulgaria even under Zivkov, Poland under Jaruzelski are more or less tuned to the new line of Gorbachev whereas Romania under Ceausescu 
Czechoslovakia and uh, Husak and now Jacek, uh, and East Germany under Honecker, the leadership of these countries are obviously against it, fearing that the reforms envisaged by Gorbachev would lead to tremendous dangerous developments from their viewpoint in the countries of Central Eastern Europe, developments towards a democratic and freer life which they will not be able to control. And that is why the leadership of Czechoslovakia, Romania and East Germany is now against it. Okay, ready. 2372, take one. 21. Okay. And that is why the leadership of Romania, Czechoslovakia and East Germany is now so strongly against Glasnost and Perestroika. What if Gorbachev succeeds in his reforms in the Soviet Union? If Gorbachev and his reform followers would succeed in Perestroika in somewhat changing the Soviet system, making it more transparent, more effective, more lively, more full of initiative, then I think this will have great repercussions in all countries of Central and Eastern Europe belonging to the Soviet bloc. I have a limited optimism, implying that sooner or later similar reforms now envisaged by Gorbachev will become a reality in the countries mentioned, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Poland particularly. Uh, they, my limited optimism is economic, technological necessities are so strong that you can't avoid relatively far-reaching economic reforms in these countries. Two, in a country of a communist dictatorship, you can't separate economic reforms from a change in the political and cultural atmosphere, a change in the methods of political power. So therefore, the economic reforms will lead to a liberalization. And three, the people, especially in the younger generation, are not ready anymore, in the former, like in former times, to submit to a dictatorial authority. They become more autonomous, more independent, showing their own wills, their own wishes, their own demands. And fourth, if in the Soviet Union the great perestroika will succeed, which might take 10 or 15 years, then it will become increasingly difficult and later impossible for any leadership of East Germany or Romania or Czechoslovakia to block itself. Then it will spill over. These four points give me the hope of a future liberalization in the communist world countries of Eastern Europe, not in the Western sense of the word, of a multi-party system, rule of law, pluralism in the Western sense, but a change in the methods of political control, greater autonomy and uh, greater possibilities in cultural and intellectual life, greater participation, even if this is from our Western value system, not very much, for the people living there, it would be absolutely essential if such a liberalization will take place in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.